In this video, I'm going to walk you through the highlighted uh, Leo Marx article, The American Ideology of Space. And I've marked in red the passages I want you to read, and I'm just going to point out some things to you. So we're talking about in this article about the European conception, European and early American uh, conceptions of space in North America. In other words, uh, what Marx is going to do is talk about three myths, and we're not using myths in the tr in the, uh, the definition of like falsehood or, or uh, misunderstandings, misconceptions. We're using the word myth here as cultural ideas. How, how do people see themselves as a nation? That's how the term myth is being used here. And he's looking at um, the myths that were um, kind of established about the American landscape again by Europeans uh, before they came here and the Europeans as they came here uh, before they were even you know, considered Americans. So this will be important to uh, what we're talking about um, for this unit. Um, so what I want you to do is go through and read all the highlighted areas like you see on the, the screen here. They're, uh, they're underlined. And I have also a, a map here I'll show you in a second. So Marx argues that um, the, the original European conceptions of North America um, were that the, the white spaces, let me show you this map here, here we have, um, get my highlighter on, here we have South America and obviously South America was a little better known, there are, in this map, you see a lot of place names already sketched in. This up here is the map of um, North America, and I believe this was in the 1580s, this particular map. And as you see here in North America, out around the coast we have place names and identifiable features, but everything in the middle is blank, right? This hasn't been explored yet, um, it's here in North America. So what Europeans were seeing was this internal white space as being, um, it, it, it's, it's seen in a couple of different ways. And that's what uh, Marx is talking about in this article. How is that, um, that wilderness, that space, that landscape envisioned by Europeans? Um, so I'm going to scroll down here to his thesis. His thesis, his claim is a lot bigger than that, but we're just going to look at one strand of it, his second point here where he says his purpose is to sketch the emergence and relative importance of three variants of that, um, that ideology, that way of looking, uh, that in, in the era, era of exploration and colonization, that way of looking at the value and social purpose of American space. Okay? So as you go through, you'll see places where it says begin reading here, and then as you go down, it'll say end reading here. So those are the passages I want you to read. We're not going to read the whole article. Um, so the first, um, the, the first thing that the um, explorers noted when they, they came to this new world is that it seemed to be just e enormous, uninhabited, unclaimed. Um, kind of a contrast between the new world and the old world. So the, the, what, what was seen um, is that this movement from east to west, east from Europe over west to the new world, becomes repeated again and again. The people on the east coast eventually moved to the west coast. That moving wall of the frontier moved as the land was explored and cultivated and um, um, civilization moved from east to west. So th our symbolic myth, uh, Marx is arguing, is one of a journey, that, that journey from east to west. Um, and that begins with the idea of Columbus discovering a, a word itself that's freighted with um, bias and, and presumptions, that movement from east to west, first eastern, east of Europe, uh, east from Europe to, to the west of, of North America, and then the, the westward movement within the country. All right. So his first, um, his first interpretation of the myth 
is, a, is what he calls the utilitarian interpretation. This is the idea that that white space on that map, let's look at it again, that internal space here that I've circled in red is a place that is uncivilized, it's unpopulated, regardless of the fact that there are Native Americans living there, this is, this is land that's considered unpopulated because the Native population is not cultivating the land. To the early Europeans who, who came to North America, um, the land was not considered, um, th there was no civilization unless land was being cultivated. So there were um, people living here, but they were not, they were not even seen really as even human because they weren't tapping the resources, they weren't improving the land, therefore they didn't really own the land and it was there for the Europeans to take. This is an idea from John Locke that Marx talks about later on in, in the section that you're not going to be reading. But in a lot of the early writings, we hear a lot about the howling wilderness, these small pockets of land along the east coast that were settled, and then the vast forest surrounding them where um, it's dark and scary and it's not cultivated, it's not civilized. So the wilderness being um, a physical wilderness and a metaphorical one for a lack of, of civilization. So this is, cons this is what he calls the utilitarian interpretation. And he talks about um, this, this bias against uh, the, the emptiness of, of the landscape um, ex exerts itself, it makes its appearance in the writings of the early explorers where they would um, ignore the beauty of North America, ignore the beauty of what they were seeing, and they would just uh, send back home long lists of natural resources that would be useful or potentially useful to Europeans. So they had a little different way of looking at the landscape than we do in the 21st century. So this is the section where you would end, you'll skip the information on John Locke unless you're particularly interested in that. And then we're going to go on to his second um, idea, it says begin here again, the primitivist version, which he says, um, Marx, Marx argues that um, although this idea is more important to us in the 21st century, it didn't really have much of an impact on people of the time. There were a few voices going along this line, which is why he mentions it, but it's not really one that ever became dominant. And the primitive, primitivist idea of this natural landscape is that um, nature is um, opposed to civilization. So nature is a place of freedom and spontaneity and happiness as opposed to the dark side of civilization which um, carries with it war, poverty, crowding, um, social constraints, that sort of thing. Um, so that kind of leads to our 21st century ideas of conservation movements, uh, national parks, just the, the, the joy that um, nature nature gives you, which is obviously very different from the utilitarian um, idea that nature is there simply as a resource for people to use. The third one is the pastoral uh, myth, which, <coughs> excuse me, grows out of the primitivism. Um, again, a more minority, um, um, a minority idea in the early Americas, but um, the idea that now coming to the new world that people could somehow live in harmony with nature. Um, so nature and mankind would, would work together. Um, he, Marx uses as his example Thomas Jefferson writing in the 1780s that um, the Republic would um, reject manufacturing. They would not have factories like they did in um, Europe, but rather that uh, America would be a place to send raw goods to be manufactured in Europe, but would not have um, factories itself, that idea of living in harmony with nature. And this um, kind of prefigures the, the idea um, that, that has become dominant since World War II, the that, that conflict between um, economic growth and um, environmental quality of life that we, we still um, struggle to balance. And that is the end of this article. So read the places in between. I've just given you the highlights, but that's um, that's the gist of.
this article by Leo Marx, The American Ideology of Space.